So before we get into the stuff that you're up to today and where we see the future going, mm -hmm. I would love to just to dig into the archive a little bit. Like, who was Larry before he had the internet to play with? What were you playing with as a kid? Where did you grow up? I, I, I grew up, I was born in the Seattle, Washington area, and I grew up in Alaska. So my um, family moved up to Alaska uh, there, and I was, a, you know, always usually the shortest kid in my class, and I, I, I got into philosophy in a big way. I wanted to be the great American novelist, uh, but then I decided I needed to actually know about life before I did that. Um, and uh, then I went to college uh, at Reed College, which is a good liberal arts college on the West Coast. And um, let's see. Yeah, and I, I didn't actually get online, per se, until 1994. But I did, like a lot of people who grew up then, I, I, a lot of geeky kids, I actually started doing a little bit of programming in, like, 1983 or something like that. So, yeah. And, and when, when did it kind of, the penny drop for you that the internet wasn't just going to be a little add-on to our lives, but it was going to be absolutely fundamental to all of our lives and indeed, obviously, to yours? Uh, so, soon after the web um, sort of hit the mainstream with, with uh, you know, the Netscape browser and so mm -hmm. forth, about 1995 or so, mm -hmm. um, I had been talking on, you know, online um, discussion groups and made a couple of my, myself and I was talking to friends it, it's going to be so great I mean just think of all the possibilities we could actually you know see up to date movie listings online <laughs> were they, <laughs> were they just saying you're crazy today. were yes. they saying you were crazy or were they on board uh, that's, no uh, you're right uh, a, a lot of people just didn't get it at all mm -hmm. uh, um Right, and, and it was the same thing with Wikipedia, by, by the way. I mean, 80% uh, of the people that I talked to about Wikipedia in the early days just thought it was just an obviously bad idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm just, just wasting my time entirely. <laughs> so. And before we get on to that, how, yeah. how did your work in philosophy inform sort of how you got into approaching the internet? So you got this like thinking going on and then these tools come along mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, and so how do you think that kind of shaped and, and maybe carried on shaping it in a way? Because what yeah. you built is very different to what a lot of the internet looks like today. So yeah. I'm, I'm interested to know. Um, so I have a PhD in philosophy. My specialization was uh, epistemology. Mm -hmm. So I've thought about um, and, and read, studied, written a lot about um, standards of knowledge mm -hmm. in general and, and uh, uh, thinking about the, the reliability and the justification of knowledge um, a lot over the years and come, being a, of a skeptical bent in general, philosophical uh, skeptic um, in general, um, that, that uh, made me sensitive to the possibility of error online, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why whenever I start processes, I try to think systematically about things that could go wrong mm -hmm. and, and, um, and do my best to build safeguards. And the, mm -hmm. the fact that wikis, um, on the one hand, were absolutely free and open to everyone and um, had a, a minimal friction, it was really important to the success of Wikipedia, um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, what everyone told me about wikis, and you know, when I first started learning about them, is that they're actually really robust because mm -hmm. people can um, uh, easily modify each other's work and roll back, you know, um, vandalism and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, the fact that there are this sort of natural built-in process mm -hmm. for. Uh, vetting information um, is is one of the things that just made uh, a wiki uh, um, approach uh, kind of obvious, but that wasn't good enough. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we'll get onto that. But I, I like that that thinking that openness doesn't mean weakness. Actually, that natural yeah. systems are all symbiotic. Quite the contrary. And and if you've got these sort of self writing mechanisms, that actually produces strength in the long term. Having that diversity of input. That's right. So take us into the the beginning stages. Then I'm sure everyone's fascinated to know. <laughs> You've, you've found the internet, you've got this thinking behind it, mm -hmm. and then what were the very first, like, emergent, you know, the seeds coming out of the ground for the first time moments of the Wikipedia story? 
Um, well, uh, I so just tell the like the beginnings of, of like how how yeah. that started. Okay, um, so. I was wrapping up work on a, a website, um, Sanger's Review. Was, uh, it was actually a, um, it was a, a, a review of um, reports about uh, uh, the Y2K problem, the millennium bug, right? Um, but of course that ended up being a dud and I, I was actually gonna pivot it into um, what would soon later become known as a blog. Mm -hmm. um, and I shared the idea with some mock-ups with various acquaintances and friends, one of whom was Jimmy Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, don't work on that. Come and work on this, uh, you know, uh, you could be the editor-in-chief and, and the person who starts this free encyclopedia project on behalf of Bombus, which is the parent company of, of, right. of this. The, the, the name that, uh, that he had already registered was Newpedia, N-U-Pedia uh, dot com. Um, and uh, basically, th his instructions were very vague. Um, uh, basically, do a little bit of background reading about open source uh, and um, look at the examples of the DMOS, if, you're, if you remember that long ago, um, the, the open directory project, mm -hmm. right? It's crowdsourcing the writing of, a, of, a, of an early Yahoo kind of uh, directory. Okay. Um, and uh, it, take lessons from that and try to craft processes for creating uh, a, a user-built encyclopedia. Sure. Um, so we ended up making this seven-step process because we both agreed it's really important to, to have a, a reliable um, encyclopedia. But the problem was after working on it via email and then a web-based um, uh, um, development process, um, it was just going too slowly. Um, so by that fall, you know, like nine months, it, had, it was already clear to both of us that, that um, I was gonna have to find some way to to um, make it easier for just regular people to contribute. Mm. Um, so I made various pretty lightweight proposals, but they all required extra programming, and, and Jimmy wanted to keep things as lean as possible, mm. no more like programmers. And I just had one programmer to work <laughs> on uh, with. with uh, so Newpedia. demanding, one whole programmer. <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, and a system administrator. And then, um, uh, a friend told me, um, January 2nd, 2001, um, over a, a Mexican dinner in, in uh, San Diego, um, about wikis. Mm -hmm. um, and he had been, he was very geeky, like me, and, and um, he, he had spent a lot of time basically working on these collaborative pages where, it, it, amazingly, they, they weren't crap, but anybody could go to the page and just hit a, an edit button without even logging in yeah. uh, and, and just start editing the, okay. the text on the page and hit save. Even now, the idea sounds absolutely absurd, mm -hmm. but if you go to Wikipedia, at least on a lot of pages, it still works that way, wow. right? Wow. Um, and that's how it worked then. Fantastic. So basically, uh, on the spot, I thought, well, we could use this to solve the problem that we were having with Newpedia. Okay, that's great. And then you alluded earlier to the fact that this sort of crowdsourced way solves the problem of it being too demanding for a small team and actually has some self-regulating mechanisms, but you said that that wasn't enough in the end. So, so what ended up becoming the problem as you see it and, 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 and move us on to where your thinking is, is at the moment? Um, the, the problem with, with Wikipedia in general, well, you said there were some limitations to yeah, that yeah, yeah. method. And right. Well, um, to fast forward a, a, a little bit, after we launched Wikipedia over the objections to the, the, the more professional academic sort of Newpedia editors, um, we launched it separately under its own domain name, so it came up with the name Wikipedia. Um, and uh, what happened was, um, initially, like, 80% of the people working on, on Wikipedia were just people who I had recruited for Newpedia. So there were a lot of academics and a lot of serious students. Um, but then it started getting waves of people 
from Slashdot, which was uh, basically a, a programmer's site, kind of the, uh, pr the, the progenitor of, of like TechCrunch or something mm -hmm. like that, or, or the next web for that matter, mm -hmm. um, except it was more you know, a, a group blog. Um, and, uh, and a lot of those people were sort of cyber anarchists. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, some of them were great workers and worked really hard, but some of them really caused a lot of trouble, you know, um, just rejected the whole idea that we were working on an encyclopedia, for mm -hmm. example, just wanted to write their own opinion. Uh -huh. And actually trying to, within a totally open context, mm -hmm. mind you, trying to get them to work on an encyclopedia in particular, and also to leave their personal biases out um, it was it was very difficult. I guess it wasn't that the self-regulation for that wasn't as competent enough as it needed to be to handle that yeah. nuanced new wave that of That was basically my job in the right. first year. Right. Yeah, to sort of like rein in all the bad actors, or not necessarily bad actors, just people who had a different vision for what we could be doing with what was basically just a, a blank chalkboard, you know, yeah. and people could write anything they want. It's a very brave thing to do, uh, yeah. and it's a, clearly it's had a dramatic <laughs> effect on all of our lives. Um, but so bring us up to date now on 2019, like where do you see, uh, where do you see the future of collecting knowledge? What, how do you think we, with the tools that we have available today, you know, how do we build the best architecture to make sure that we have, protect our knowledge and, and, uh, and, and yeah. uh, manage bias? So I've, I've been thinking a lot about, about I it. this um, problem because I, I I look at Wikipedia as being a bit of a missed opportunity, actually. Uh, it could be much, much better. There's, there's only like 10,000 active contributors, mm -hmm. people who contribute enough uh, to, to Wikipedia in any given month to have the right to vote for administrators on mm -hmm. Wikipedia. It's not very many I didn't know that. for a top five website, yeah. right? Um, it could be millions. Well, why isn't it? Um, and the reason is that it's centralized in a way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's decentralized in, the, in that, you know, it lives in cyberspace. Anybody in the world can contribute to it, and nobody is, like, calling the shots for everyone. But it's centralized in the, in the fact that it is a single website, mm -hmm. right? It, it is a, um, it has its own unique culture. Um, its own unique set of rules. Mm -hmm. And not everybody in the world who wants to work on an encyclopedia mm -hmm. wants to work within those rules. So on a content level, it's kind of decentralized, or tries to be, yeah. but actually on a framework level, and actually even where it's hosted, where is it hosted? Um, I, I think they've got servers in but different places. It doesn't really matter. But, it's, it's, but at the back end, it's kind of more of a centralized yeah. architecture. No, okay. it is, it is. Yeah. So what would it mean to go beyond that then? Well, um, create a, a decentralized encyclopedia network, mm -hmm. right? Um, what ought to exist, and this, this is the conclusion that I came to and the thing that I'm working on now, basically. Um, in, in 2015 or so, uh, I came up with the following idea. What should exist is a database of all of the encyclopedia articles in the world, right? And then the ability to um, rate all of those articles. So... We, if we can uniquely identify individuals so that there is reliably one person, one vote, and then everybody has the right to vote mm -hmm. on what they think about each article, mm -hmm. um, then basically there would be a, a knowledge marketplace, a competition mm -hmm. to write the best article on each topic. Um, and then imagine this, if, if there were that unique identity system in place, then users could, if they wanted to, volunteer information about themselves. You could say what your politics were, your religion, your nationality, your college degree, and whatever. And then you would be able to go to the page, uh, or rather the, the topic, God, and there might be a few different dozen articles about God. And um, the order in which they would be uh, ranked would differ based on whether you wanted to view the average rating of all users or um, uh, just the ratings of the Christians mm. or just the ratings of the atheists mm. or just the ratings of the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And then you would have, uh, presumably, a competition within each of those groups to write the best representation of their understanding of God, 
for example. Um, and then it would be fascinating, I think, to right. compare the top rated articles on each of those, from each of those points of view. You see what I'm saying? So, so is this, this uh, way of thinking, is this wrapped up in every the project it, you've been It is. On? This is what I'm working on this year, actually. Um, so uh, Before we go on to that, yeah. I, I've never had a more varied soundtrack, by the way, to the background music for an interview. We've gone from like, it, like folky <laughs> stuff over there to like crashing thunderstorms over here. It's like a gladiatorial arena. So it's keeping it nice and diverse, even in the soundtrack. But tell, <laughs> tell us about Everpedia. Well... Uh, Everpedia began as a, a fork of Wikipedia in, in 2015. Uh, I wasn't among the co-founders. I joined the company 18 months ago or so. Um, and, but the, the, uh, we have pivoted, basically, when I joined the company. And the reason that I joined the company is that uh, the guys decided to move um, Everpedia to the blockchain, basically. What this means, essentially, um, is uh, Everpedia would become not just a single website, but, as I was saying, a network. Um, with uh, And the way a blockchain works, should I explain that a little bit, what a blockchain yeah. is? Yeah. Okay. So you can think of a blockchain as a distributed or, or shared um, a database that lives in copies uh, in different what are called nodes or servers, basically, all around the world. Um, and uh, they are kept up to date with each other. Um, and depending on the blockchain, there are rules, right, protocols, um, that are used to decide whether all of the different copies will be updated mm -hmm. or not, right? So if they come to an agreement with each other, um, then a new block is added mm -hmm. to the chain, right? Um, so I, I think a lot of the blockchain instances, Bitcoin and the other currencies, we've been quite focused on the the currency side of the opportunity yeah. of blockchain, but really it's a way for, it's a decentralized way of authenticating truth, right? Of trying to, uh, not least, in an existential sense. Yeah, no, but, it's, uh, it's a way of authenticating um, that, that in the opinion of the block producers, um, that, that the rules have been satisfied anyway. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's just, in the case of, of the Everpedia blockchain, it, that's just a democratic vote. If more than uh, half of the users agree that a certain edit or a new article is uh, acceptable, then it's, then it's mm -hmm. added to the database. Okay, cool. Um, so is Everpedia like up and running right now? Is it, it is. People can go and use it right away? Yeah, yeah, but uh, well, we're gonna be um, we are going to be relaunching the site later this month or, or next okay. month. Yeah, and, and it's going to be as easy to use as Medium. Mm -hmm. um, so just uh, if you've ever edited Wikipedia, you know you have to learn this um, somewhat arcane, especially for non-technical people. It's kind of difficult um, to e edit a Wikipedia article because there's markup. That, mm -hmm. I mean... It's not that hard, really, but it, it does, definitely turns a lot of people off. Well, what if you could do exactly that sort of thing, but using a completely WYSIWYG editor okay. um, that were uh, fully modern? Okay. Right? So, so uh, Wikipedia, or Everpedia, rather, started uh, with a WYSIWYG editor. They, uh, these college students basically wrote the, the software from scratch, which was very impressive to me. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's being entirely rewritten. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really easy with social media functions built in. And um, So is it fair to say Everypedia is kind of like Wikipedia Mark II with yeah. decentralized uh, back end and a uh, delightful, beautiful front end so that even laymen like me can get involved. And I love the way you put it. <laughs> yeah, we should have you as a spokesman. Um, no, um, I think uh, it's more than that. Uh, that's sort of like the first phase yeah. of development. The second phase of the development is what I was talking about, where we actually start including encyclopedia articles and maybe entire encyclopedias in the network. So the Everpedia network is not owned by Everpedia. It is a fully decentralized uh, blockchain. Mm -hmm. And 51% uh, um, of our tokens, and the tokens are what govern the network, um, are owned by EOS holders. So we did an, what's called an airdrop. We basically gave away over half of, of the tokens to holders of the tokens of the technology that, uh, that Everpedia mm -hmm. is built on. No. Okay, so yeah. on an ownership level as well, it's quite different to a 
private company or a yeah, charity yeah. or that kind of stuff. So I, I, I have built over the years connections with a lot of different um, encyclopedia publishers and I've talked to a, a good number of them in, in the last 18 months and um, they are all interested in, <laughs> in participating. That's fantastic. So yeah, um, I, won't, I won't name any names but you know some of the names. Okay, I can um, believe it. It's rewarding and, and giving more ownership and more limelight I guess to editors and making it less technical for them to get involved as well. Yeah. Yep. So um, we're going to turn to you guys in a second for a couple of questions but just before we do, in the, in the main arena in there, we've been running a social entrepreneurship competition, these 20 global finalists you know, from around the world trying to solve the world's problems, right? And they're thinking about recycling, they're thinking about moving away from sugar to more sustainable stuff. On a data level, on a knowledge, on an internet level, yeah. is there a piece of advice that you could give them as they're developing their organizations or for any of us here trying to do our daily lives or run our businesses? Like what, a, a takeaway that maybe from like the, the brain of Larry, the philosophy of Larry, that we could take away an action in our own lives that might help us to invest in the internet in a way that looks good for us. Um, I don't know about uh, literal investment, mm -hmm. um, but I would, I would think that for activism of all sorts, one of the biggest problems is basically just getting out the word to mm -hmm. people who are ignorant mm -hmm. um, and uh, doing so in a way that is not constrained mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and that is subject to uh, editing, um, mutual editing by, by like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So the plot platform that we're building actually will uh, enable people with a, a particular point of view, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as radically environmentalist as you like, yeah. to actually develop mm -hmm. um, uh, articles and materials and, and so forth, as long as it's in an encyclopedic form. Um, to to uh, essentially get the word out, I would say that that would be uh, uh, not a bad thing to do. But as a you know, for a future of the internet, yeah. do, do you would you go as far to say is that you kind of believe in a a future of the internet that is more decentralized, that shares more of the ownership, or do you think it's yeah. a case by case basis? Uh, I I think in general, I I hope that uh, as we learn more and more about how important privacy is mm -hmm. and security, and um, as, as, we, as our eyes are opened, as I hope they have been the last couple of years, to just how uh, loose and careless we have been mm -hmm. with our own private information, right, um, that, that uh, we will learn the answer is, is actually decentralization. Mm -hmm. If we own our own, what this means in terms of our own information and privacy in general is, is owning your own data. Mm -hmm. uh, that means serving your own data um, from your own resources that you pay for yourself instead of letting Facebook or Twitter or whatever hold your, your stuff mm -hmm. um, and, and publish it on your behalf and make it available to others mm -hmm. on your behalf. That's something that you should be doing. Okay. Um, and they can then use your stuff. It's the same way with YouTube, for that matter, right? You should be able to put your video up, host it somewhere. Obviously, you have to pay someone to host it. But it's that service would be radically uh, uncensored, mm -hmm. right? And then you can instruct or permit YouTube to republish mm -hmm. your stuff there. Uh, that's, that's the idea. And then you actually have ownership, mm -hmm. and you can make that as private as you want, and you're never subject to uh, YouTube's terms of service or Twitter's or Facebook's mm -hmm. or whatever, and you can really lock down your uh, information. I, I think the, the way to do that on a mass scale mm -hmm. that is usable by every, everyone mm -hmm. in the next five or 10 years is gonna be the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is gonna be the thing that enables that to happen. So maybe a vision of how we interact with the internet is at an ownership level, at a publishing level, we hold our stuff in a decentralized environment, and then we can play within these walled gardens. We can upload to YouTube from there if we want, but ultimately we don't give them permission to, to hold the ownership as we ha probably have been with most of well, our digital Well, if we lives. think that they've, if they've been um, abusing it. Mm. Like in the case of, of Facebook, for example, um, uh, I wish that um, I could 
keep all of my subscribers and they could continue to follow me just as easily as they do now, but outside of Facebook. Mm -hmm. But when I deleted my Facebook account, which I did in February, um, permanently, by the way, I didn't just, I, I, I got rid of everything. Wow. Um, I, I, I wish I could have stayed in touch with those mm. people. I set up a mailing list, right? But that isn't the same, mm. right? Um, I wish I, that, that what would exist is um, various social media readers in the same way that there are blog, reader, mm. uh, blog readers. Mm. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a common standard for social media posts, which doesn't exist, right? And then, again, if I own my own data and I own basically my... Uh, followers list, mm -hmm. then somebody could go to another service mm -hmm. and they could look at all my my feed there and they could look at their friends' yeah. feeds there too. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't be tied down to Facebook. Facebook would be just the service yeah. that aggregates um, the data from many different sources. Brilliant. That's how it should work. That's how the internet used to work and mm -hmm. how it, it could continue to work. The man has spoken. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. Is there anybody got any questions? A couple of quick questions they'd love to ask Larry. Have we still got him? Self set. So if anybody didn't hear the question, am I right in saying it's about how do you manage um, moderation across language and culture? Okay. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Do you, you mean in the context of, a, of an encyclopedia, right? Yeah. Um, well, we uh, have actually hired some um, organizers in... Uh, Korean and uh, Chinese, because those are the, um, uh, like most of the holders of EOS, um, um, and therefore the recipients of our airdrop um, are from, from Asia. Um, and so it's natural that we would, we would do that. Obviously, um, the, you know, standards, uh, uh, the, the societal standards um, for uh, different places are going to be different. They, they should be respected, in my opinion. Like, uh, if it's all aggregated and, and centralized in one place, in the, in the case of Wikipedia, or to change the example, Quora, for example, um, then a lot of the local nuance is lost. And I think there's a, a real problem with that. I think that can be, that, that can be um, supported not only in the Everpedia model as, it's or, as it already exists, um, but also in, in the second phase of development, again, um, if there are the equivalent of, of uh, a tags um, where uh, if you want, um, you could declare yourself to be Korean, um, and then um, all of your posts uh, uh, you know, and your ratings uh, are reflected in the rankings of articles. And so it'll be a lot more interesting to you and engaging, I think, um, if you go to uh, a, 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 a knowledge competition that shows the, the ranking according to, well, mm -hmm. Koreans. Um, I, uh, there's a lot more to mm -hmm. be said on that. It's a deep question. I'm sure we could have a whole other session, yeah. a whole workshop on that. Yes. Um, I'm afraid we've actually run out of time. So oh. uh, first and foremost, I just want to uh, hope you'll join me in giving Larry a massive thanks for coming on today. Thank you. Um, there's not that many people I feel like I can trust when thinking about the internet, but I feel like, I feel like you're a voice that I can really uh, honestly uh, I can hear and take your advice. So I appreciate you chatting with us. Um, and if you, if you didn't know, Shivas partners with The Next Web to host the global final of their social entrepreneurship competition, which happened yesterday. And each year they give away a million dollars to social entrepreneurs all over the world. It's pretty rad. If you missed it, I can see there are a couple of the finalists lurking around here. A wee Scottish boy over there in the corner with a big ginger beard. And if you want to go talk with him, he's got an amazing business. There's probably a few others hanging around. But um, thank you all very much. And thanks for your patience. And have a great rest of the day.
Thanks, Larry. Really appreciate it.